Hey, folks. Um, I'm Anatoly, co-founder of Solana, CEO of Solana Labs. I'm a silly dragon. Uh, welcome. This is the only word I know in Dutch. Um, it's awesome to have everyone here. This is uh, like every year, you know, we spend a lot of time working. We're all staring at computer screens. And I literally forget that there's people on the other side of all those tweets and like all those people building stuff. And every year I get to come to Breakpoint and meet you guys, talk to you, and just reminds me of how big this community is, like how dedicated everyone is to, to building and delivering value and like figuring out how do we get crypto to mass adoption. So it's really inspiring. You guys are doing all the work. I get to stand up here in a dragon suit. <laughs> Um, and it's, I think, really important for us to talk about like the what and the why we're building. Like, why are we here? What are we actually trying to accomplish? Um, we have this, you know, there's a lot of folks in the industry talking about alignment. Um, and we do have an alignment thesis. You know, we, we kind of try to joke about it, but it's somewhat serious. And it's pretty simple, but it really does align a diverse group of engineers that are all trying to, like, get stuff done. So does this release actually reduce latency and increase throughput? It's a very objectively measurable thing. You can actually go and test this. Uh, and it's important that, that that's true, because being able to test these things actually does give a guiding metric of what we're supposed to do. And if yes, like this stuff actually gets better release after release, year after year, then it's aligned. And that means the technology is actually moving in the right direction. And what that direction is, is one giant global state machine that unifies the entire world at the speed of light, you know, as fast as physics allow, so we can have this magical, composable, giant interface for finance, for gaming, for social, for all the stuff that we want to do with cryptography. Um, you know, some of my favorite examples of this, and folks will talk more about them, are, for, are things like Helium. You know, there is now a $5 data plan in Miami that I can explain to my parents that if they buy this, <laughs> if they lived in Miami, they could buy this plan, they would pay five bucks a month for their cell phone service, and somewhere behind the scenes, Solana does something. <laughs> but it's actually really cool because Helium uses compressed NFTs, they use tokens to incentivize where those hotspots go, they use payments and all this other infrastructure that was built by many different teams, not, not Solana, that all come together in this one computer that's shared between everyone. You know, and you have folks like Star Atlas building a, a AAA game, a magical space opera with like lots of fun stuff you can do. You can buy ships, you can trade resources. And the gamers probably, you know, some may know that it's running in a blockchain, but a lot of them may not. And this game alone generates more transactions per day than most layer ones, literally more than Ethereum. And if you really like nerd out about finance, you can actually see composability in action. So if you do like a 20 cent trade on Jupiter, it will actually pull liquidity from four different markets. So imagine you went to like your foreign exchange desk at the airport and you're like, I want to trade 20 cents for 20 euro cents. And they're, and they're like, well, if you get, you can get the best price, but you got to talk to four different markets, right, four different companies, and you'd go to each one and you'd trade, like, trade two or three cents. It would, it's impossible for that to happen in the real world, right? But in a one giant shared computer where there is no friction between any of these different companies, it's all shared state, and it's all running at the speed of light, that, that can actually happen. And that's clearly a better system. Um, it's cheaper, it's faster, it's a technology that's an improvement over what's existing today, even though those existing things are running on centralized servers without any of these like, limitations of decentralization, they've actually built something worse. And this is why I think crypto will eventually win. It's inevitable. Because these systems, because of the constraints we put on ourselves, trying to make it open and transparent and decentralized, actually force us to build something that is you know, dramatically better. That's clearly a win f for everyone. So, I'm really excited to be here, excited to be still working on this, excited to still nerding out on the, the hard engineering challenges. And like, 
it, it's pretty fun. So how do we like plan and do this stuff and like how do we you know, actually like, try to move this technology forward is we always had this philosophy at labs, and now you see that philosophy adopted by fire dancer folks and everyone else working on core is we try to do the hard things first, really solve problems that we know that uh, a really smart engineer can't solve over the weekend. And this is why we never built a really good infrastructure like Helios, because we knew the community could do that. We never bu built an amazing wallet like Phantom or Soulflare or Backpack because we knew the community could do that. But we spent countless hours staring at benchmarks, at debuggers, trying to figure out how do we make the system faster because those are the problems that take you know, one engineer that's excited, that's thinking about them in the shower when they're eating breakfast day in, day out. It takes a year to get this stuff done. So these are the hard problems that we really focus on. And it's because of this. Every year, the number of transistors double in chips. When I started programming, we had about 5 million to 10 million transistors per chip. And literally, 20 years later, there's now 10 billion to 5 billion, in some cases 50, 50 billion if you count GPUs and stuff. But it's an absurd improvement in technology. And to a lot of folks, right, that's not really noticeable because every year it's kind of like a marginal impact, but it's very compounding. So in 20 years, we're literally going to have 1,000x in block space, right? As fast as Solana is today, as many things it can, as it can do in parallel, it's going to be 1,000 times more. And um, it's actually really, really hard to write software that does that. Uh, it's painful. I still have nightmares of when I had to do this for ARM and mobile phones. I can imagine two debuggers trying to debug why this chip is busted. Um, and we get to experience the joy of figuring out how do we squeeze this like, decentralized operating system into these improvements that are happening, regardless. Right? It's just every two, every two years, these hardware engineers are going to do better and better. And this was a hard pro problem to solve. Like, I don't know if folks remember like Windows 95, Windows 98. These were single-threaded environments that could run one application at a time on those single-core chips. And everyone in the industry, from Intel and TSMC and whoever, couldn't inc make them any faster. So they started adding cores and add parallelism. And a lot, you know, in, in fact, most folks don't realize, but like it took a massive undertaking at Windows, at Linux, to actually take those operating systems and make them run really, really well in those multi-core environments. You know, there were like 50,000 people at Microsoft trying to move from a Windows 95 kernel to Windows NT. Eventually, they did it, but it, it was a painful process. If you were an engineer at that time, I'm sure you remember. <laughs> but um, this is what this is what we're doing. These are the the hard problems that we're solving. And they're important to solve because if we don't, the hardware is going to improve. It's just going to keep getting faster, and we would miss a massive opportunity to build the best product ever. So we really love pushing those boundaries, making Solana the fastest, most efficient, lowest latency, highest throughput. And you could really see this, I think, over this year with some of the technology improvements that we launched just at the start of last breakpoint. Um, I've talked about this everywhere I could, and this is like one of the coolest things that we got to discover as building this network, is this idea of local fee markets. So not only does the chain have to be parallel in terms of execution, it has to be parallel in terms of economics. And um, when I was working on like our operating systems for mobile and ARM, we didn't have to worry about economics. This was just not, not a thing. You just build your software, you ship it, people use it, everyone loves you. I think decentralization and this idea of permissionless networks really is a new challenge for, for operating system design. And this is something that we had to, to figure out as we're building the, you know, fly the plane as we're, as we're building it. So what's really cool about local fee markets is, unlike these other single-threaded environments that you see everywhere else today in crypto, Solana can run multiple things at the same time, and it can also separate them into separate economic zones, if you will, where if there is a hotspot, if there's a ton of demand for an NFT or a ton of demand for liquidation in some DeFi market, that those things don't clobber each other. You can actually process both of them at the same time 
fees can go up and down independently. And that creates this isolation that prevents hotspots from creating very large fees for everyone else. Uh, and it's really, really cool to see this live. You know, we had um, this year, we had a really cool example of this. As Helium was migrating from their layer one, they were minting a million NFTs on Solana at the same time where Backpack was launching their Matlats NFT set. And it was like the most boring event on chain. You couldn't even tell that anything was going on. So those were some of the hard problems we solved. And uh, I think folks have seen my posts about this, but there's a, you know, quite a few hard problems left. Um, and we've been working on these, uh, you know, I think since the chain really from inception. And it's really nice to see that all this stuff that we're working on is now being built incrementally. There's no additional giant releases that we need to do. There's no rewrites. Uh, it really feels good as an engineer when you're in that kind of in that part of the technology cycle where you're just making fast releases, you're incrementally improving it, and things are getting better and better. Um, and we see this across all of these problems that we've been working on, and we're getting closer and closer to actual release. So I feel like we really turned a corner going from those early days where it was me and 12 engineers you know, staring at debuggers and, and Grafana graphs and trying to figure out what is the current fire <laughs> that we needed to solve like over the weekend uh, to a very mature network that now has tons of contributors, different teams working on core clients, implementing the same protocol from scratch, and actually all collaborating on this one vision of making a cheaper and faster and better you know, global state machine. Uh, and talk about uh, how this process works, how we actually get to herd all these cats and coordinate them. Uh, I'd like to invite Dan Albert, who's the executive director of the Solana Foundation. Hey, everybody! Thanks for coming to thanks for coming to Breakpoint. Welcome, great, great to have you all here. Um, and thanks to Tolly, um, gave some great overview of the tech um, and where we're going. And I wanted to give a shout out um, and talk to all y'all about the people who are making it happen, um, our core contributors. Um, so I sit at Solana Foundation, and um, one of the things that I have sort of the privilege of doing at Solana Foundation, we exist as a coordinating entity, kind of a, uh, an enabling entity for our great community. And I have the privilege of working with so many of the teams across the ecosystem. Um, our core contributors uh, really are the ones that are driving all of this great tech that Anatoly was talking about forward. Um, and this space has really evolved and blown up in just the last year or so. Um, so. We've got so many more teams that are making contributions, working on core, working on the protocol. Um, and I just wanted to uh, kind of give a shout out and acknowledge like, as not just the technology is maturing, so are the community of folks that are really making it happen. So earlier this year, um, we introduced Solana Improvement Documents, SIMDs. Um, this is a central place for folks to make formal proposals, to improve the Solana protocol. Um, this is where we're getting structured debate, discussion, discoverability of what's happening next. Um, and just since our launch earlier this year, we've had 79 individual SIMDs written um, by 29 authors across nine different teams in the ecosystem. Right? Um, we've had, you know, in the early days, it was mostly uh, Anatoly, myself, a bunch of folks just at Solana Labs kind of cranking out all these new features. Um, it's really awesome to see all of you guys pushing the Solana protocol forward together as a community. Um, for example, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, the team at Tiny Dancer recently landed uh, SIMD64. There was, this was uh, Tiny Dancer's a community uh, team. They put this together. Um, big step forward in enabling light clients on Solana. There was a lot of debate, a lot of back and forth between a lot of different folks in the ecosystem. Um, came to consensus on adding this uh, transaction receipts into the protocol to kind of help push the, the whole state of things together. It's not just in SIMD as in sort of this formal process that we're seeing maturation and growth of our core, core contributors. 
um, we're seeing a lot of grassroots meetups, meetings, and process from all of you guys in collaboration with folks at Foundation, folks at Solana Labs. Um, our core developers are getting together, jamming out, debating these SIMDs. Our validator community has started to self-organize a bunch of ongoing calls. Um, the Solana Staking Alliance is a grassroots organization that is debating and pushing forward the conversation of what on-chain governance and the future of governance for Solana could look like. And this is really great to see um, this decentralization, not just in the network, not just in you guys building apps, but in the folks that are driving the protocol forward. All of this comes together, why? Long-term network resilience. Solana should have no single point of failure anywhere, and that includes at the protocol layer, that includes at the sort of human element. There shouldn't be any one team that the entire network is dependent on to push updates or to understand the protocol. Where we see this play out, in particular, is on the validator network. Um, in 2022, there was a single client. Uh, this was the validator software re released by Solana Labs. Um, and we see just a little sliver from uh, our friends at, at Jito, who've released uh, an MEV-optimized fork of Solana. Um, today, 38% of mainnet runs Jito. This is an alternate client. They've made some changes to the, the original one. Um, so it's really great to see not just the adoption, but also a second team that has pushed stuff to mainnet. Ideally, what we'd like to get, uh, four separate validators written by four separate teams in four separate programming languages with optimal uh, kind of even distribution of stake across mainnet. Why? This gives the network full resilience in the event we have some catastrophic bug, an entire network, imp uh, an entire validator implementation goes down or needs to flip over immediately. Uh, we have no sort of resilience issue on the network, no outage, no risks at all. One team that is really helping us drive this forward is Fire Dancer. The Fire Dancer team is here in force at Breakpoint. We're going to hear a lot from them over the coming days. Um, Fire Dancer is a ground up rewrite of the Solana Validator. Um, piece by piece, this team is rebuilding the Solana Validator in high performance C code to be fully compatible with the Solana network of today. Um, early tests, early demonstrations have shown somewhere between 10x and 100x, sometimes more, improvement in some elements of the Solana stack. All of this is running on the same validator hardware that anybody on mainnet runs their node on today. So these guys have been hustling hard, um, really done a lot of work. I've been chatting with them. They've been working around the clock for the last couple weeks, and I am really excited to announce that right now, First version of Fire Dancer is live on Testnet. Well done, Fire Dancer team. This is a huge step forward for the network. It's a huge step forward for the technology. Um, I'm going to be back here in a couple hours to um, kind of give a deeper dive on exactly what that entails and what the next steps are. Um, but for now, to talk a little bit more about the network, I want to invite up my colleague, Amira. Thanks all so much. All right, how mind-blowing is Fire Dancer, everyone? Yeah, come on, it's not Heat Dancer, it's Fire Dancer. How mind-blowing is that? That's right. Well, Fire Dancer is incredible, and I get a little giddy when I hear about it, but it's important to note that there's actually four validator clients that are currently in development or live on mainnet. That, and two are currently live. That makes Solana and Ethereum the only two major blockchains to have more than one live validator client. Woo, Woo is right, yeah. Woo. Why is this important? Well, a validator client is the software that a blockchain runs on. You want there to be multiple types of software, or multiple pieces of software that the chain runs on for resilience. If there's a zero day or a, line, a bug in the line of code on one of the pieces of software, you want to make sure that stake is running across multiple validator clients in order to make sure the network stays resilient in case of an issue with one of them. So, oh, so uh, there's the original Solana Labs client. There's Fire Dancer, where, which you just hold, uh, heard a lot about. There's SIG, uh, which is being developed by Syndica in the ZIG programming language. And there's Jito, which is currently live on mainnet. And this is a pretty cool graph. So Jito 
went live just over a year ago in August 2022. And since then, Stake has climbed up steadily until it's reached about 36%, 38% today. This is massive, right? We have tons of distribution already on the Solana network and more to come. When we think about resilience on the Solana network, we think about a number of different factors. And so at the foundation, we release uh, a regular Solana Foundation validator health report where we evaluate a bunch of different metrics for health on the network. One of them, pure number of validators. And on Solana, this number is quite high. There are over 2,000 block producing validators live on mainnet today. These are 2,000 validators independently confirming new blocks to the network. This is huge. Another classic metric of decentralization is the Nakamoto coefficient. The Nakamoto coefficient is the minimum number of nodes that would need to collude in order to halt the network. And on Solana, this is at 23. It's one of the highest amongst all proof of stake chains. So it's pretty impressive what we've been able to see in terms of these sort of, I'd say, more classic metrics of decentralization. But I like to look to some of the less classic measures because I think these are really important. I think of these as exogenous factors in the health of the network, particularly distribution across data center and geography. Why is this important? Well, you don't want any one data center or any one country to have more than 33% of stake running through it. This presents an exogenous threat to the network. That means, let's say, there's a private company with a lot of Solana stake running through it, and for whatever reason wants to halt the network, they could do that. Same with a nation state. Let's say there's a dictatorial nation state out there who, for whatever reason, doesn't want people to be able to use the network. You don't want that country to have any more than 33% of stake running through it. You want to see a lot of distribution. On Solana, you see a lot of distribution when it comes to data center. You know, there are some major networks out there that have more than 50% of data center distribution on AWS. This is not a problem on Solana. No data center has anywhere close to 33% of stake. And we're pretty well distributed in terms of geography as well. No country has close to 33% of stake running through it. Uh, and there's actually 11% of stake right here in the Netherlands. So shout out to all our Dutch validator friends. Yeah, thank you. I want to pivot for a second to talk about the environment. This is an issue that is really important to me. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Solana Foundation, we wanted to measure the carbon footprint of the Solana network. And so we hired a consultant who had a very unique set of skills. Uh, he knows climate tech really well, and he knows blockchain tech really well. And we asked him, can you evaluate the carbon footprint of the network? This is a challenge. It's, it's hard to evaluate the carbon footprint of any classic organization or piece of technology, but he had to figure out how to do it for a really distributed blockchain. And that was the start of the Solana Energy Use Report. And so every six months, he would do a painstaking review of the carbon footprint of the network. A few months ago, earlier this year really, we wanted to see if we could push it further. And we were approached by a group of developers based out of Seattle. And they said, you know, we think we can measure the health of the validator network in terms of the carbon footprint in real time. We can use software, we can crawl all the validators and figure out what their carbon footprint is by cross-checking it with this data that we have that measures the carbon footprint of data centers around the world. And so this April, Solana became the first layer one smart contract blockchain to have its carbon footprint measured in real time. You, yeah, there we go. This is awesome. You can go to solanaclimate.com right now and look at the carbon footprint of the network, right down to the validator level. Uh, this, is, this is really uh, exciting to see. You know, as someone who cares a lot about this topic, I know, I think we all know, that if we're going to fight the climate crisis, the first step is having an accurate measure of emissions. Um, and it gives me a lot of pride uh, that we were able to help lead the way and deliver this kind of accuracy and thoughtfulness for Solana. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the Tricarbonara team who went out of their way and helped test this out with us and made this into reality. This is really, really incredible work. And what does the data show us? Well, it shows us that Solana is pretty efficient on a per-transaction basis, not just in Web3, but also in the Web2 realm. So a single transaction on Solana is about the energy equivalent of 700 joules. That's less than the energy that it takes to do a single Google search. So the data is pretty amazing there. But climate Real-time carbon measurement is not the only climate positive thing happening on Solana. There's an incredible network of over 20 regenerative finance or refi teams that are building on the network. 
There's over 100 builders. They get together on a Zoom call once every couple of weeks, figure out how they can collaborate, and they're doing really inspiring, amazing things. You have groups like Sunrise Stake making it possible to take your staking yields and use them from carbon offsets. We have projects like Gain Forest and EcoToken that are tackling an incredibly opaque, really hard to wrestle with carbon market and using the tools of transparency and accessibility on blockchain to really take on this market head on and apply a novel approach to it. Uh, you have companies like YHI, which are applying the lessons of Deepin to weather tracking. Uh, there's even someone in the group who is using helium hotspots to track lions in the Maasai Mara. Like, it is really, really cool stuff. Uh, so I'm super excited by the growth of these projects, and you can hear more about them on this stage later this week and then also over at Basecamp. In short, the resilience, the speed, the efficiency of the Solana network, these are all things that people have been working extremely hard on for six years with a bunch of new capabilities being added to the network that have been critical in just the past year. Why is that important? Well, to tell you, I'm going to invite a Solana OG to the stage. Uh, he is the head of protocol development at the Helium Foundation. Let's give a warm welcome to Noah Prince, everybody. Hey guys, how's it going? Thanks, Samira. That was a really good overview of the network. The crazy thing is there's just so much going on that we can't get it all into a single presentation. And that is a pretty cool problem to have. So how do we encapsulate all that's happening on Solana? Well, I think the best way is with a meme. It's a meme that took off on X, Twitter, whatever we're calling it now. Uh, but increasingly, it's starting to gain relevance outside the cryptoverse. I am, of course, talking about only possible on Solana. <laughs> now, how do you explain to people like what is truly only possible on Solana? And I think one of the best ways to do it is something very near and dear to my heart, Deepin. Yes. Apparently, after NFTs, we didn't learn our lesson with horrible acronyms that nobody understands. Stands for Decentralized Physical Infrastructure Networks. Yeah, I still see a lot of blank stares in the audience. That's OK. I think the best way to explain Deepin is with one of the OGs, one of the very first Deepin networks, which is Helium. Helium had this crazy idea. They were like, we want to coat the world in wireless signal. How do we do it? Well, we let ordinary people just purchase inexpensive hardware, and they can basically become their own cell phone tower. So. Somebody goes, they deploy their hotspot, they earn tokens for doing it, and then you use that hotspot to say, I don't know, post on Twitter instead of working. Now, it seems like a simple problem, but it's actually not, right? You have hundreds of thousands of people deploying hotspots, and if you're lucky, you have millions and even billions of people using those. And everybody is paying or expecting to be paid. That's a lot of micropayments. Now, when Helium started, this was 2019. Solana wasn't really around. So they basically had two options. Option A, you could use Ethereum, hope they kind of figure out the scaling roadmap, or you're just going to drown in fees and congestion. Or option B, you can build your own blockchain. These guys were kind of crazy, so they built their own blockchain. But you fast forward now to 2022, and it's not you don't really need your own blockchain anymore. In fact, it was distracting from the actual building of the network. Um, I won't bore you with my thoughts on the app chain thesis, but if you talk to some of the guys that were working on Helium at the time, it is not easy running your own blockchain. Um, in fact, if you want to learn more about it, you should talk to Abai. He's giving a talk on uh, Thursday. But suffice it to say, in late 2022, the Helium community made a historic vote to move to Solana. And what happened six months later was insane. It was a great migration. It was a culmination of months and months of work across many, many, many teams. Guys, we literally turduckened a blockchain. We took an entire L1 and we shoved it into another L1. Like, it's just, it's insane. And you didn't hear about it because nothing happened, right? Like, if Solana had crashed, if Helium had crashed, this would have been like front page news. Like everybody would have covered it. But 
Nothing happened. And what's crazier than that, we were shoving like a million transactions into Solana. At the same time, Mad Lads was launching, nearly gave me a heart attack, probably one of the like, most botted mints because everybody wanted one. NFT marketplaces were going, DeFi was going, payments were streaming across at the speed of light, and nothing happened. Solana just took it. So this is what I mean when I say only possible on Solana. And speaking of only possible on Solana, we also represent all of our hotspots as NFTs. And we minted damn near a million of them. 430,000 or so were active, and a bunch of them were dormant but could come on at any time as compressed NFTs. Guys, we saved hundreds of thousands of dollars doing this, like very real savings. Now, if you want to know more about how we, you know, turn into blockchain, I'll be giving a talk about that on Friday. So what's the utility of all this? $5 unlimited mobile plan, currently just in Miami. It's insane, right? $5 for your, your mobile plan? I don't know how much you're paying Verizon. I pay them a lot. So how is this possible? People look at me and they're like, what's the catch? There is no catch. The, the, the catch is that Deepin uses open source pathways to open up a ton of roadblocks that's faced by these capital intensive incumbent networks. Blockchain just can do it better. And it's not just Helium. Deepin is kind of changing the way that we think about crypto as a whole. See, most of the ways that people get into crypto before was through a centralized exchange. So you would go, you would hook your bank account up, you would buy some tokens, you would wait 12 days so that you could actually touch them and send them to a real wallet, and maybe take an ad bill for your headache. Now, let's say you're an Uber driver, and you want to just earn some tokens on the side. Well, you can grab a Hive map or dash cam, put it in your car, help map the roads while you drive, and earn tokens while you're doing it. You can deploy a Helium hotspot. You got that gaming rig that you're not using while you're working, you shouldn't be using it, lend it out to render. This is the cool thing about Deepin. And then you have tokens in your wallet the next day. And then you could use those to pay for your Helium mobile plan. It's insane. And it's not just Deepin that's kind of seeing this, right? We, we have the same problem as Visa, actually. Visa wants to do tons and tons of micropayments super, super fast. And they realized and they, they chose Solana. Not for any other reason than it's just the only place that it's possible, right? You need something that has been re-architected from the ground up to reduce latency and throughput, or well, reduce latency and increase throughput. And it's not just Visa, you can use the Shopify integration and now millions of merchants now have access to Solana Pay. So this is what we mean when we say only possible on Solana. And inevitably, every time I say this on Twitter, I get a reply guy that's like, well, actually, <laughs> you can do this elsewhere. OK, tell me where else you're going to shove an entire L1 into another L1, right? Like, only on the L1 that's doing more transactions than most other L1s combined. So we did it. It's only possible on Solana, but we did it right now. It's not like a theoretical thing that's possible to do. We, we, we did it. And we did it in six months. And not only did we do it in six months, we built open source governance tooling. We built subnetworks. We built all of the crazy things that were probably too hard to do on our old L1. And as much as I'd love to sit here and like pat myself and my team on the back, I work with some amazing people. But Solana is part of why this is possible. Because the developer tooling on Solana is just amazing. And probably the best person to talk about developer tooling on Solana is the CEO and co-founder of Helios, and also the CEO of brutally ratioing people on Twitter, <laughs> Mert Mumtaz. Thanks, Noah. Um, Noah from Helium, not Helios, by the way, a few mix-ups in the past few days. And I know what you're thinking, could I have named the company any worse? <laughs> and the answer is yes. 
I could have named it Token 22. <laughs> but on a serious note, thank you to all 75 Solana developers who've shown up today. Raise your hands if you're building on Solana. Raise your hands if you're building on Solana. Let's go. Come on. All right. Slightly more than, slightly more than 75. Um, so for those unfamiliar, that was an actual meme that spread on Twitter this year, that everybody was leaving Solana and only 75 developers were left. Of course, it is interesting how much we've built with just 75 developers this year. Um, localized fee markets, state compression, reduced hardware requirements, even privacy directly on the L1 with Token22. In fact, the most recent hackathon, um, Solana Hyperdrive, had a record 907 submissions, the highest ever. which is particularly impressive, given that each of the 75 had to have submitted over 12 times each. <laughs> you know, Tolly was just out here talking about multi-threading and fast execution on Solana. This is what he was actually referring to. And, um, you know, everyone was probably annoyed or angry at these false rumors at the time. But looking back, I mean, I know I was. You might have noticed on Twitter a little bit. Um, Looking back, this was actually the best thing to have happened to Solana. Because events like this have a tendency to wash out those who are here for the wrong reasons, the tourists. Or as Logan Roy would say, non-serious people. <laughs> as a result, those of you that are here, those of you who stayed here in this room but also watched around the world, are serious people and are the ones who will define the future of this network. And you guys have all been through a tremendous amount of adversity this year and have only come out much stronger as a result of it. And I think for that, the entire Solana community deserves a big, big round of applause. You guys will be the ones to build the next Coinbase or the next Uniswap. You might even define entirely new acronyms like DeFi or NFTs or DPIN. Those were all built during the depths of past bear markets. And there's no reason why you can't do the same right now on Solana. In fact, it's already happening. One of my favorite examples is Vib, the co-founder and CEO of Drip, Vib rejected the premise that NFTs had to be expensive and scarce. With the help of compression, instead, he made them accessible and abundant. He changed how most of us think about NFTs. He took a big swing, and the end result is one of the best applications in all of crypto. In fact, part of the reason why he was able to focus so much on the product side here, is because he did not have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. We talk about things that are only possible on Solana all the time, and this is the perfect example. On no other chain can you mint millions of NFTs for a few hundred dollars. It's simply not possible. In fact, the closest thing I can think of was a company that tried to do, not an L2, but an L3, um, and they still couldn't get it. Um, that's right, an L3, three Ls. <laughs> I like what uh, Joe McCann from Asymmetric Financial says about L3s. He says, you know, the reason they call it an L3 is because now you have three problems. <laughs> <laughs> but on Solana, you can channel all of your energy towards building, experimenting, and product, versus worrying about gas costs, alignment, fragmentation. You can build entire mobile networks like Helium. You can map the world like HiveMapper. 
You can even send money across the globe near the speed of light, like Visa. And that's just from the past few months. We are just getting started. Solana already does more, more transactions per second than most blockchains combined. That's a crazy stat. And if that weren't enough, we're still working on things like Fire Dancer, compression, multiple slot leaders to keep pushing the performance of the network. Solana is at the very forefront of distributed systems engineering. And if you're building on top of Solana, you actually have a very real chance of shaping the future of the entire industry. That is not hyperbole. Now is the time to build. We don't have to wait for a hypothetical future where blockchains suddenly start to scale. You can already build applications that are fast, cheap, and scalable on Solana right this second. Well, maybe not right this second. I mean, I know we all love Solana as much as the next guy. Unless the next guy is Austin and Anatoly. Thank you. Welcome to Breakpoint 3. Yeah. How you guys doing? It's awesome, man. Fire Dancer is live on Testnet. Fire Dancer is live on Testnet. I feel like you've been waiting to say that for a while. Yeah, yeah, forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we wanted to chat a little bit today about some of the recent network changes, some of the improvements that have gone into making 116 what it is today. If you're a developer in the audience, or if you're someone who's a power user of the network, you've probably noticed that things are a little snappier than they used to be. Um, and there's a lot of work over the last, what, 18 months that went into that. Um, yeah, let's, let's start with a few of those. Like, what were some of the big things for you that went into 116, and what's that process of getting there been like? Yeah, so like, um, so the way that, engineering works is uh, there's a lot of folks that come into master and roughly every three months uh, the team tries to make a release where we take what's ever currently stable on testnet recommend that it's you know there's audits and testing and stress testing after three months it seems like things are stable enough to where it's good enough at least as good as mainnet we recommend that folks upgrade if they, if they want to and then we can cut a branch of whatever's on master and, and start stabilizing that. And that sounds really good in theory, but uh, early on in the early de days of the network, you're kind of like fixing fires and you're trying to improve all these things and you get like, make design mistakes, right? Like we didn't have local fee markets and that ha needed to be shipped as fast as possible. And when you're trying to put out fires, it's very, very hard to have that awesome stable incremental schedule. So you get, things that take a year to release, and, and, th and that, that's not a fun place to be as an engineer. But what's awesome to see now is that like, that process is very smooth, and we get to get incremental, we get, we, we're at a stage where every release is incrementally better. And some of the things that just turned on in 116 is, you know, we made a bunch of optimizations to Turbine where nerdy optimizations. We're now like the, the batches of shreds and turbine are now Merkleized, and there's a commitment instead of a signature for each one. And that means that even if there is a par like partial failure in the internet, if part of the network can recover the block, it means the rest of the network can recover it because it'll automatically repair and recover and, and send everything out. Um, and you see on a normal day-to-day you will see like the difference between 98% of the blocks arriving to 99.5. And for somebody that, <laughs> <laughs> for you guys, you may not see that as a, as a huge difference, but for the engineers working on this, it is a massive improvement. It's like 70% better. And when you get to those optimizations, it's when you start looking at the chain and you're seeing that almost every block is perfectly within 400 milliseconds. That means that like maybe now 
could be the time where you can tighten that a bit. Maybe we can start setting block times to 300 milliseconds. Not promising that, and I'm sure if Bizad is listening to this, he's like shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> when, when things start running very, very smoothly, you can, you can push things to the next level. So stuff like that is really exciting to see. If you're running a validator and with 116, I'm sure you saw RAM utilization is much better. There's trade-offs there. Now you're using SSDs. You have to have high-performance SSDs for this, but RAM is much more expensive than SSDs. And it's nice to see that drop. It, mean, it means that you can now deploy cheaper hardware, and that means that the chain is more accessible for, for folks. And all, thing, all those things are good. Yeah, and we also started to see the beginning of some of the token 2022 features really come into 116. As we're, well. we're good at naming things. Token 22 was developed in 22, <laughs> shipped in 23. Makes perfect sense. Finished <laughs> uh, in 24. Yep. Yeah, but it's a. Uh, it took a lot, a lot of collaboration with ecosystem teams and asking them what features do you think they were missing from the, the SPL token implementation and trying to get all these folks aligned and um, get all of those changes shipped. Nice thing about working in the application spaces, it's not tied to a 116 release. It is really working on, on in kind of the, the user space is what we call it. But you still sometimes need to make changes to the layer one to support new features because a lot of the advanced cryptographic operations, like things to support zero knowledge or new signing curves and things like that, you do need to add system calls and make changes to the runtime. And that requires coordination between all the core teams that are working on Solana. So if you, if, you, if you want to add a new cryptographic primitive, it means that the Fire Dancer folks have to agree that that's important. So it, it does take a bit more work now. Yeah, Dan was talking a bunch about that earlier, about the SIMD process and how we have multiple validator teams that are all having to coordinate around new features. Um, what's that process kind of look like going forwards? Does that mean more frequent releases, less frequent releases? Um, I'm hoping that we get to a very nice kind of set schedule that every three months everybody knows there's a new release. It has whatever features are stable. We're not really worried about getting any feature in. It's really like, is this stable? And if, that, if that's true, then it's, it's much, much better. So that's a, every engineer's dream. It means you're not firefighting. You're actually just working on a, a long-term roadmap and, and things are cranking. Yeah, I think that's been really great to see. And like a bunch of the usability tooling for this stuff. Like local fee markets, right, shipped technically end of last year. They got sort of adopted by the ecosystem in the first half of or first quarter of this year. But then like a lot of the things like the RPC calls for estimating yep. fees. And it's really nice to see that sort of more complete suite of we've gone from tech has been made to tech has been deployed to tech has been made very easy to use even for someone like Helios to tie into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably the best example of that is state compression. Yeah. Um, you know Publishing the, the spec and the implementations and working with Metaplex is just one part. You still need wallets and RPC providers and, and, and indexers to adopt it. And even, even after that, you then need ecosystem teams to really spend the time iterating on product and getting that light bulb moment, like, oh, I can have a whole new business model like uh, Drip does. Yeah. So um, we'll hear more about all of those different types of things from different folks today. We got Token 22 news coming up later today. But before we sort of wrap things up, there's just one more thing that we wanted to talk about today. Um, the last two years of Breakpoint and this year are incredible. Uh, Europe has been a great home for the conference. But since we sort of finished year one, we've been wanting to take Breakpoint uh, out of Europe and into a different market. Uh, there's so many people all around the world that are trying to build on Solana, and it feels like the conference has to move with them to, to new places. So uh, we're really excited to announce that Breakpoint 2024 will be in Singapore. This is, this is the first time we're taking uh, Breakpoint to Asia. It's an incredibly fast-growing market for both developers, and we, we really see this as a really important step. Um, you'll notice those dates align pretty well with Token 2049. We know it's expensive to get there, so hopefully folks can, can uh, stack a few trips together. So uh, I'm really excited to see that. Cool. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, 
thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll be back later. We're going to kick off the main programming today.